Karen Cookin, Secretary of Church Council. And I'm Kevin Cookin. Welcome to Augsburg.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister in the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare unto you the entire forgiveness of all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, Let us pray. Compassionate God, you gather the whole universe into your radiant presence and continually reveal your Son as our Savior. Bring wholeness to all that is broken and speak truth to us in our confession that all creation will see and know your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Welcome to Augsburg, and we give thanks for your presence today wherever you are gathered for worship. And if you are joining us in community as a new, we welcome you and hope that you will find ways to be spiritually enriched in our fellowship and education activities we offer each week online. For those who are already part of the Augsburg congregation, a reminder that Sunday morning at 11 a.m., if you're watching this before that time, is our called congregational meeting as we vote on a call for the deacon role and regarding our outdoor gathering space. Please plan on being present today as we look to see how God is at work in these opportunities. A reminder that next Sunday, February 7th, we will have drive-through communion, and all are welcome to participate in God's gift of the Eucharist. You'll receive a flock note this week inviting you to sign up for a particular time, and if you don't get that or have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact the church office. As part of this time, we would continue our annual tradition on the first Sunday of February of our Super Bowl of Caring, an opportunity to collect financial gifts for our partners at the Christ Beloved Community Food Pantry. We'll have folks out there on Sunday morning at drive through communion with the traditional soup pots as we have every year there to collect your gifts, or you're also welcome to send them in designating Super Bowl of Caring. We're grateful for all the ways that you share God's abundance. Our service continues now as we hear God's word.
One in six people in Northwest North Carolina are food insecure. We are asking each one of you for your help. On February 7th, you can bring your financial contribution to our drive through communion or mail it into the Augsburg office. We can make a big difference when we all come together to help. Jesus calls on us to help people in need. Super Bowl of caring. Let's care. I want to ask each one of you to help. February 7th, help us make it super. Thank you for supporting the Super Bowl of Caring. Thank you. A reading from Jonah. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You shall heed such a prophet. This is what you requested of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly when you said, If I hear the voice of the Lord my God any more, or ever again see this great fire, I will die. Then the Lord replied to me, They are right in what they have said. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their own people. I will put my words in the mouth of the prophet, who shall speak to them everything that I command. Anyone who does not heed the words that the prophet shall speak in my name, I myself will hold accountable. But any prophet who speaks in the name of other gods, or who presumes to speak in my name, a word that I have not commanded the prophet to speak, that prophet shall die. The word of the Lord.
reading from 1 Corinthians. Now concerning food sacrificed to idols, we know that all of us possesses knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Anyone who claims to know something does not yet have the necessary knowledge. But anyone who loves God is known by him. Hence, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that no idols in the world really exist, and that there is no God but one. Indeed, even though there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as in fact there are many gods and many lords, Yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things and through whom we exist. It is not everyone, however, who has this knowledge. Since some have become so accustomed to idols until now, they still think of the food they eat as food offered to an idol, and their conscience being weak, is defiled. Food will not bring us close to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat, and no better off if we do. But take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if others see you, who possesses knowledge, eating in the temple of an idol, might they not, since their conscience is weak, be encouraged to the point of eating food sacrificed to the idols. So by your knowledge, those weak believers for whom Christ died are destroyed. But when you thus sin against members of your family and wound their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food is the cause of their falling, I will never eat meat, so that I may not cause one of them to fall. The Word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus and his disciples went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Just then there was in the synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed, and they kept on asking one another, What? Is this a new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. About 30 years ago, a man named Jack Brown wrote a book for his son who was leaving home for his freshman year in college. The book was titled Life's Little Instruction Book, 511 Suggestions, Observations, and Reminders on How to Live a Happy and Rewarding Life. It contained brief, quotable reminders of things to do to make life more rewarding for himself and for others. I think that the book of Deuteronomy might have served a similar purpose for the people of Israel. 
Deuteronomy contains a series of sermons offered by Moses to the Israelites as the people of Israel were on the threshold of entering the land that God had promised. Moses gave them instructions and encouragement about how to be in relationship with God and how to interact with each other. Moses reminded them of God's law and the importance of keeping God's law once they were established in the land. Moses was hoping to inspire them to remain loyal to God as promised in the covenant God made with them. But Moses also warned them of the consequences they would experience if they disobeyed God. In today's Old Testament reading, Moses' time of leading the Israelites was coming to an end. He was stepping down after 40 years of service. God had called him to lead the people of Israel out of slavery to a better place and to be the one who would speak of God, passing down God's laws to them. Moses did not do this on his own. No human could. It was God who spoke and guided Moses through this long, often seemingly impossible journey. Now, God had told him it was time to go. Our lesson begins as Moses assured the Israelites that God would raise up a prophet like him and put God's words in the prophet's mouth so that they would have someone to speak God's word to them. We don't talk about prophets often, but in antiquity, prophets were plentiful. Prophets were ordinary people called by God and spiritually connected to God. They were not governed by political or religious entities like kings and priests and judges. They were direct agents of God. Their primary task was to faithfully speak God's word to the people. Prophets carried the responsibility of challenging circumstances that were unjust. They often predicted the future. At times, the words they spoke challenged people's long-standing beliefs or their words rendered judgment. When God seemed absent to the people, God was found in the words that the prophet spoke, offering God's hope and promise. We know many prophets by name, Abraham, Moses, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Miriam, Deborah, and Jeremiah are among them. There were also people who claimed to be prophets, but they weren't. These false prophets spoke in the name of other gods. Often they prophesied things that did not come true or that God had not commanded them to speak. In an earlier chapter of Deuteronomy, it is written that false prophets would be put to death. And this holds such significance. Our text covers the fate of false prophets once again. Even though Moses is the spokesperson, it is God who is the focus of this passage. God would be the one to call a new prophet who would be like Moses. Being like Moses was not that the prophet would duplicate Moses' work, but that the similarity would be related to the authority one would exhibit when teaching and commanding as Moses did. This leader would come from their own people, and God would put God's words in the mouth of the prophet. Through the prophet, God would hold accountable those to whom the prophet spoke. If we were to add all these tasks together, we would see that God was promising the people of Israel to always be present with them. Under the Torah, 
the Hebrew scripture, if the people of Israel remained loyal and kept God's laws, they would enjoy God's blessings and protection as promised to Abraham, written in the book of Genesis. If they failed in their obedience to God by serving other gods or oppressing others, God would judge Israel and remove God's protection and exile them from their land. Prophets had the responsibility to call out people when they failed to do as they had been instructed. Prophets urged them to repent and to return to the teachings of Moses. The teachings of Moses were law, which Martin Luther reminds us was to believe, trust, love, and fear God with one's whole heart. Law isn't a bad thing. Within the Mosaic teaching were rules about how to worship God, interact with the government, and how to love their neighbor. As a teacher of the law, Moses knew that humanity was not only unwilling, but unable to do what the law demanded. The law revealed people's sin, humbled them, and taught that they could do nothing through their own strength. Luther believed that the new prophet Moses spoke of, the one whom God would raise up, would not be a teacher of the law, but one who would teach a word of grace. As Lutherans, we read all Scripture through the lens of law and grace. The law convicts us of our sin and points us toward the promised Messiah, and this is precisely what this passage is doing. Jesus was the fulfillment of this prophecy that Moses proclaimed. As we look toward our New Testament reading for today, Mark described a scene that took place in the synagogue. Jesus taught as one having authority and demonstrated his power over unclean spirits. Jesus' presence, the manner in which he interpreted the law, and his ability to rid a person of unclean spirits could not be mistaken. A new teaching with authority exclaimed the witnesses to this encounter. They were stunned, amazed, and curious, and they went out to tell of what they had heard and seen. There are people in our world today who believe they speak for God. As we hear a barrage of voices of so many who think they have the solution to the world's challenges, it would behoove us to compare their words to God's heart and intentions for the world as written in Scripture and revealed through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. True prophets spoke and speak on God's behalf when people went and go astray. True prophets spoke and speak about injustice and exploitation. True prophets of God speak truth to power, not through violence or condemnation, but through the authority that has been given them by God. There are a lot of Christians and even some pastors that claim to speak or act on God's behalf, but do the messages we hear from them align or contradict God's purpose for the world? Do their messages identify and address human pain and suffering, or do they perpetuate it? Does how they live and conduct themselves match what they say or what they fail to say? Listen again to the role of true prophets of God. 
True prophets were not governed by political or religious entities. They were direct agents of God. Their primary task was to faithfully speak God's word to the people. Prophets carried the responsibility of challenging circumstances that were unjust. At times, the words they spoke at the very least challenged people's long-standing beliefs or their words rendered judgment. True prophets also spoke God's words of hope and promise. This is what it is to speak and act on behalf of God. I would venture to guess that there are none among us who would call themselves a prophet. However, we are all called to be prophetic. What this really looks like day in and day out as we live out our baptism as God's children in the world, we are called to love our neighbor as ourselves and not hurt or harm our neighbor but help and support them in every physical need. In our baptism, we are welcomed into the body of Christ and the mission that we all share to give thanks and praise to God and to bear God's creative and redeeming love to all the world. The limitless love of God and the message Jesus was called to proclaim is the message that is given to us. We are to speak and act in ways that bring peace, healing, and hope. I also think it means we are called to cease being silent and to speak God's truth as revealed in Scripture through Jesus. Each day, Through our baptism, we are raised to new life that gives us the opportunity to help transform the world in which we live into the very reign of God, where God will bring the fullness of peace, the fullness of life, and the fullness of joy to every person. Amen.
Living together in trust and hope, we confess our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Guided by Christ, made known to the nations, let us offer our prayers for the church, the world, and all people in need. We pray for all who share the gospel and proclaim freedom in Christ through the world. Prophets, teachers, pastors, deacons, and lay leaders. For the church and its ministries. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all God's works and creation, plants and animals, water and soil, forest and farms, and for those tasked with protecting our natural resources and all that exist. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for government leaders, cities and nations, elected officials and grassroots organizers, for all responsible for the well-being of civil society. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit, those who are sick and hospitalized, those dealing with COVID-19, those struggling with mental illness, those who are hungry or experiencing homelessness, and all in any need, for caregivers, hospice workers, and home health aides, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Today we lift up to you, O Lord, those names of Kathy Adkinson, Ronald Greenwood, Marty and Joe Tani, Claire Walsh, the Fornecker family, Robinson family, Paul Adkinson, Pam Barney, the family of Nicole McLaurin, Charles Brown, Roman Johns, Barbara Wise, Kathy Olson, Violet Fowler, and all those who we lift up on our lips and in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the concerns of this congregation, those who are isolated and lonely, those who long to gather again in worship, those celebrating and those grieving, for the people of God in this place and for other needs in our community. We pray, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the covenant God made with us in the waters of baptism in thanksgiving for the baptized who have died in the Lord. Today we remember Becky Fallen, Sandy Rose, Beryl Leip, Mary Zeller, Randy Lindahl, Jim Ennis, Barbara Schwartz, Virginia Fries, Mike Cahill. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful God, hear the prayers of your people, spoken or silent, for the sake of the one who dwells among us, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always.
These plates are a reminder of the gifts that God has shared with people throughout all generations. The gift of God's abundance in our lives that we are called to share with the church and in the world. Let us raise now those gifts. Let us pray. O God of justice and love, we give thanks to you that you illumine our way through life with the words of your Son. Give us the light we need. Awaken us to the needs of others. And at the end, bring all the world to your feast through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with mercy and give you peace.
Go in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.